What great words. If it costs me everything, I'm willing to do it because you're the one I adore. And, and this is how it works. As you surrender everything to the Lord, this is going to happen to you. You're going to be happier because you were created to surrender your life to him. Now, if you're not like totally surrendering your life to him, you're giving it to something or something else. And many of us have totally surrendered our lives, given our bodies, our minds, our time, our effort, been just totally consumed with something that actually was destroying your life. And it seemed like you were in a tailspin, like, can I ever get out of this? And all that happened is that you gave, you're created to give yourself 100% to something, but it wasn't to that thing. And, and for some of you, it's, it's drawing you here tonight because you gave your everything to that thing and it's left you empty, broken, and you're thinking, man, I messed up. But we, but I want you to get this. You might, everybody messed up. There's not a person here that hasn't messed up. But I, I, I got good news for you that today you can make up your mind. I'm tired of giving myself to that stuff that's destroying me, destroying my family, destroying my future, destroying my body. And I'm going to give it to God. And I guarantee if you give it to God, you're finally going to get some peace in your life. And, and, and some of you can't even sleep at night because there's some turmoil within your soul. Like, man, something's off. I don't know what it is. You'll wake up in the middle of the night. You'll just open the fridge and you're trying to find what's missing in there. Right? Maybe I see some chocolate cake. Right? Uh, and, you, and then you, you eat the chocolate cake and then you feel guilty. Man, I shouldn't have ate that chocolate cake. Right? But, but the idea is you might be going to the fridge or you might be going to a drug. You might be going to a relationship. But whatever your drug is, that you're, whatever that thing is that you're giving yourself totally to, if it's, if it's not God, I'm telling you, you're going to remain empty. Something's going to be missing. It's going to destroy your life. But I got good news for you. Tonight you can make a decision to turn your life around and say, I'm going to make a decision to give my life to the Lord. Let's give the Lord a hand that he's here for everyone that's here. He loves everyone here. You guys are awesome. Let's say, to, let's say hi to everyone online as well. Let's let them know we're here. We, we love you guys. Let us know you're here. Um, just put it on the message there, where you're from. We want to know where you're from, where you're listening from, from. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful time that we have to study your word. And, and we're studying a, a really, I mean, it's always an important portion of scripture, but this is describing the season that we're in the sacrifice that you made for our sins. Holy Spirit, teach us that we'll understand it, that we'll apply it and produce life transformation. Only you could do that. That we'll not just hear with our ears and our head, but Father, it will impact our soul, our spirit, and transform our lives. And I'm asking you, Lord, Holy Spirit, teach through me that it will not be my words, but your words. And Father, put your fire on this on this subject, on this teaching tonight, that it will change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I haven't preached on Wednesday night for a while. Um, is there any, I, I know, I know, um, I know Christian said, is there anybody here for the first time? Is there anybody here for the first time? I couldn't see who was raising their hand. Can you raise your hand if you're here for the first time? I don't know where, there we go. Awesome, right here. You're awesome. I mean, first time, some of you guys right here, first time over there, first time over there, first time over there. And, and, and you guys are first time, you're almost in the front row. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's look at Matthew 16, 21 through 28. And the title of this sermon, It Was Necessary. Say it with me, It Was Necessary. Jesus, it, 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 the book of Matthew starts off with three, it has three major sections. The first is the introduction of who Jesus is as a savior of the world. And then the second section, he begins to do all kinds of ministries, healing people, doing ministry, talking, um, teaching. And we're seeing that he's introduced as a savior of the world, as God in the flesh. But also we start seeing him have mir do miracles that no other man has ever done. He's casting out demons. He's walking on water. He's feeding 5,000 people five loaves and two fish. And these are documented miracles, not only in the Bible, but even the historians of the time 
uh, would write down the miracles that Jesus did. The scripture says that he did so many miracles that there's not enough books in the world to actually co contain what he did in just three years of ministry. But we know he made a major impact because, you know, we're in the year 2024, 2024 years after Jesus came. And Jesus is the only person to ever cut time in half. There's nobody that's ever like, it's before, you know, it's, it's, it's BC and then, and then we got AD and then it's before Christ. And, 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 and then we're seeing that we're counting up from there. Something major happened over 20, I mean, 2024 years ago. And it was that a man came came to earth and did miracles, but he did something that no one ever did. Not only do miracles, but he died, which that's nothing because everybody dies, but he did something that no one ever did. He resurrected from the dead. That's powerful. And, and either he resurrected from the dead or he didn't. And if he didn't resurrect from the dead, everything we're doing is a waste of time. Because if he didn't resurrect from the dead, I want you to understand this would be the condition that Jesus would have been in. He would have been a sinner like every one of us. The reason we don't resurrect from the dead unless God resurrects us from the dead because sinners stay dead. And that's why every single great man that ever lived, whether he was a, whether he was a great conqueror or he was a great religious figure, every single one of them lived and then they died and then they stayed in their grave. But Jesus was the only one that lived, did miracles, like no other man ever did miracles. Then he died, and then he resurrected from the dead. Now, now, that's really important because if Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, we'd be serving a dead God that couldn't change your life today. But the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead, because I want you to understand, Jesus did not resurrect himself from the dead. It was a father, it was a spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead. And that same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead is available right now to do a resurrection miracle in your life today. You might be thinking, man, it's dead, it's over, man. I've messed up too much. There's no way this thing can be turned around. And I have some good news. That same resurrection power is available for you today. Now, the third part of this, his ministry is he does all these miracles. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's becoming really famous when he was here on earth. Thousands of people would follow him, not only to hear his teachings, but also get his miracles. They would bring demon-possessed people to him. And, and there were cities that he would go to that every single person that was mentally ill, every single person that was demon-possessed, every single person that had cancer, every single person that had any kind of disease, after they had encountered with him, he would heal them all. Imagine that. Every one of them would be healed. And, and crowds began to follow him, and people began to hear about what Jesus was doing. But and then he shifts. And this is when he shifts. His disciples are starting to understand who he is. As a matter of fact, in, in, in the same chapter, Matthew 16, I think verse 21, Jesus asked Peter, who do people say I am? Like, who are they saying I am? And well, some people will say that you're a great teacher. Some people say you're a prophet. But, but then he goes kind of just said, well, who do you say I am? And this is the big question. Who do you say Jesus is? Because it's really important for, for you to, who Jesus is to you. Because if you misdiagnose that or misinterpret that or misdefine that, you can miss it all. And then Peter goes, I know who you are. You're the promised Savior. You're the promised Messiah. And then, and, then, and then Jesus says, man didn't reveal that to you. God revealed that to you. Wow. He goes, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, when Peter thought, uh, get the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah of the world, they had a different interpretation. They literally thought that Jesus was going to come as a king like David and just take over the world. And I could just imagine Peter saying, this is the Messiah. This is this, the, the king of kings. He's come to earth. He's going to overthrow the Roman Empire and every government on earth. And then he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. And I'm going to be his right-hand guy. Imagine how excited he was. They go, we are going to take over the world. And I am part of his posse. This is going to be amazing. I could hear the disciples because this is what they were saying. Who's going to sit at his right hand? Who's going to be the right-hand shot caller right next to him? 
And they were talking about this because they're thinking these Romans, they don't even know what's going to hit them. They're right now abusing us. They're putting us as slaves. But this is ready to turn around. And so they're excited uh, because they're thinking Jesus is coming like a king like David. He's just going to overthrow governments. Now Jesus began to see, say something that they never heard of until this point. Jesus has a different, I mean, he has, a, he has, a, he's going to, his goal is to conquer the world, but conquer the, the world's hearts and to save them from their biggest enemy, an overthrow of the satanic kingdom. They were focused on physical kingdoms and Jesus was focused on a satanic kingdom and he was focusing on their greatest enemy, which was their sin. And this is the problem. From Adam to today, we're all born with the same problem. We're all sinners. And even when we have babies, they're cute, but they're baby sinners. Right? And, and that's why all babies, even though they grow up a little bit, I mean, they don't like to share. That's mine. They'll bite, they'll scratch, and, and then they grow up, and then you're going to have to, like, train them to do what's right. Because if you don't train them, you're going to train an animal. Have you ever, this is the idea, when kids don't act right, they must say, who are the parents? Because they're saying, man, someone has not trained this little, this little beast, this little wild animal. Because we have a, all have a sin nature, and that's why there's no one here can say this. I never lied, you liar. If you say you never lie, you're lying. You're lying. Right? You can't say you never lusted. You lusted. Right? And some of us lusted right in service. Pray, ask God forgiveness right now. It's okay. Come on. But the idea, we, we've all sinned. We've all got angry. We've all said things we shouldn't have said. We've all dogged people. We've all talked bad about people. We've all done some self-destructive things. We've all sinned. But there's a problem. Sin comes with a price. And the wage of sin, of breaking God's law, sin is just breaking God's law. You must understand, it comes with consequences now, and it comes with con spiritual consequences, it comes with physical consequences, it comes with mental consequences, it comes with relationship consequences, and it comes with eternal consequences. Now, we need to talk about this because we're living in a world thinking it's just going to remain like this forever. But the reality is, I was just spent, I just spent my whole afternoon at the hospital, and my, my uncle, he was a pastor for years, uh, but he was breathing in the last breath, and uh, me and Lisa went over there, spent time with him, and he passed this afternoon. He's going into eternity. Now, now, now that he's going into eternity, what really matters now, and, I, and this is, you have to understand this, you cannot take anything from this earth with you. The only thing that you could take from this earth with you is your soul... And the souls of those that you impacted, that's it. You can't take your cars with you. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your power with you. You can't take your degree with you. You can't take your new hairdo with you. You can't take nothing with you. A matter of fact, if there's anything on you that's expensive, someone's going to take it before they bury you. So you don't need that where you're going, uh, Lord, ah, take that ring right off. So Jesus begins to deal with the, not just the temporary, not just the physical, not just the healing, not just, not, not just showing them who he was. Now he's getting to the nitty gritty and he brings, brings up a subject that they do not like. And let's look at Matthew 16, 21. It said, from then on, say it with me, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly. That we, what we're going to do now, I'm going to make it plain right now. We're going to make it plain. We're going into the most important part of my ministry, what I came to do. And even if I raised the dead and I did all kinds of miracles, if I don't do this part, no one's going to be saved. And he says plainly that it was necessary. Say it with me, necessary. That means it's a must. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that is required to attain something. It means it's God's will. So this is God's will. I got to do this. Plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the leaders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. Now, 
I want you to get this. They were thinking about this king that's going to overthrow governments. And they start thinking now, uh, wait a second, this doesn't match up. Because if you're dead, how are you going to overthrow governments? How are we going to get a position? Like, this is not what we're thinking about. Like, Jesus, you got to stop this talk. This talk has nothing to do with what we were thinking. This is not my plan. I don't know what plan you come up with, but this don't sound right. How could you be a savior and you're dying? How could you be a king and you're dying? So he brings up this subject. Now, Peter, the right-hand man that was just, was just acknowledged in the, same, in the same chapter as the rock and God was going to give him all the keys to the kingdom. Now, um, he just got cocky a little bit, I think. He started thinking, man, like, like God showed me when I said he was the Messiah, he showed, like he recognized, he had to, Jesus even recognized I'm hearing from God. Like I, I'm, I'm here from, so he got so cocky about hearing from God, he thought he could correct God. You got to be careful that you don't become so uh, like hyper spiritual that all of a sudden God tells you to do something and you think you got better ideas. Don't forget where you started. Don't forget where you came from. When you came to the Lord, you were broken. You were hurting. You tried everything in the world. And all of a sudden, your life is getting a little better. And you start making up new rules to, to make, you feel, make you feel comfortable. I don't know if I need to go to church all the time. Oh, yeah. You didn't, you didn't say that when you were going to the clubs all the time. Or the casinos all the time. All of a sudden, I'm good now. I don't need to go to church all the time anymore. I'm letting you know, you got to be careful that you don't let your pride get in the way. All right, so now, this is what Peter does. He goes, now, nah, man, we can't do this. We just can't do this, Jesus. And this is what Peter does. So Peter took him aside. That's cold-blooded right there. Literally going to take God aside and we're have a little private conversation because what you said, I'm not going to correct you in front of others, but I am going to correct you. And you know I hear from God, right? Because you told me I hear from God the, 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 in the same, same chapter. So I got some authority here. So this same guy that just heard from God that you said is the rock and go build his church on this rock and you give him the keys to the authority of the kingdom, it's talking to you. We're going to stop this talk because this is not how we're going to go down. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Now, I want you to understand, reprimand wasn't like he was just saying, Jesus, I was thinking. No, he said, I'm going to correct you. I want to let you know, this is what the repr reprimand means. I'm going to scold you. A man scolding God. And he's telling them, this is what he tells them, this is what he tells them. From saying these things, you can't say those things that you're going to suffer, that you're going to die. None of that stuff we're saying anymore. You got it? We're going to stop this now. We're going to lose some followers talking like this. And plus, I got some aspirations. And this don't sound like what I was thinking. Do you not understand this? There's a time that you got to trust God, that he's leading you, come on, in a way that you didn't plan to be led. And God is saying, there's going to be a time that you don't understand how everything works, but just God says, trust in my word, do what I tell you to do, and it will work out for you because God knows what he's doing. Are you with me still? So now, put to my side, we're going... Don't, touch, don't say these things no more. And then he goes, and I don't even know, like this is like cussing or something, but it's pretty bad. Heaven forbid, Lord. <laughs> Heaven forbid. Like literally, have, this is what we're going to do. Heaven in the, you said whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Right now, heaven, we bind what he just said. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. And the reason I said it loud like that, because it's exclamation point. <laughs> and this is what I will tell you. Never say never. I'll never do that. God says, yes, you will. You little hard head. He says, 
it, this is crazy. This will never happen to you. Now, Jesus ain't playing. Like, I can't believe that he had the audacity to correct Jesus. He don't even, Peter don't even know what he's talking about. Jesus is saying he's going to die. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. He's going to resurrect. I want you to get this. If Jesus does not suffer for the sins of mankind, no one is ever going to be saved. No one's ever going to set free. And Jesus doesn't resurrect from the dead. Everybody remains dead. Everybody remains bound. Everybody remains addicted. Everybody remains, come on, remains depressed. Everybody remains going to hell. But Jesus came to pay the price, not for his sins, but he came to pay the price for our sins. Let's sit there for a second. Let's sit there for a second. It was necessary for Jesus to suffer, die for our sins. It wasn't just a good idea. It was necessary. Now, if you, you must understand the necessity of his suffering and death. If you don't understand the necessity of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you don't understand the Bible and you don't understand life. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to get a false philosophy. Then I'm going to tell you this, a satanic philosophy that will cause you not to understand this. Be blinded to this truth so you can never get saved. Now people, I, and I talk to people all day long, and if I ask most people on the streets or anywhere or family get together, if you were to die today, and this is what, this is, the brass tax of everything. If you were to die today, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Will you end up in hell? Will you end up in heaven? Where would you go? Now that question causes a lot of, uh, I mean, it causes a lot of emotions and thoughts to come up. But this is what I've learned. Whatever they're believing comes up and they speak it. Because what you believe, you speak. So some will say something like this. I don't believe in heaven or hell. I just believe that if you die, you die. Now, you could believe that, but then I'll ask you, where do you get that philosophy from? What are you basing it on? Are you basing it on your feelings? Are you basing it on opinion? Or are you basing it on the YouTuber that you listen to? Well, that's just what I believe. It doesn't mean if you believe something, it's right. You got to have a foundation of what you, why you believe what you believe. Some other people believe they'll go to heaven because of this. They believe they'll go to heaven because they're really good people. So they have a philosophy, and I'll tell you this, it's a demonic philosophy to make you think that you're going to get to heaven and you're going to be graded on the curve. Just because you graduated from high school on the curve doesn't mean you're going to get to heaven on the curve. So you guys, I'm trusting in the curve. I know we're all failing, but I'm the best of the failures. You're not going to get to heaven because you are better than your neighbor. You're going to, because I want you to understand this. This is the condition where we're all sinners and the judgment for sin is death. You're already on death row. You're already condemned. And if Jesus does not come and save you, you remain in your addiction. You remain headed for destruction. You remain in your self-destructive lifestyle. Come on, it's only going to get worse. The cycle you're in, you can't break. You need someone to come in and save you and deliver you and give you a new life. That's why there's only one name to call on to be saved. And his name is Jesus because he's the only one that died and resurrected from the dead. Let's give some praise to the Lord and Savior the one and only Savior. So that means if you do a crime, you got to pay the price. But the problem is price is death, separation from God, misery of the soul arising from your sin. The more you continue living without God, the emptier your life is and the more miserable you become. And then you try to medicate your pain or fill that emptiness with things and people and habits and lusts of this world. And you're thinking, man, I'm empty. But if I, if I just get more of this, I got it. Well, you find yourself that you might get temporary relief for a night or a couple hours, but then you wake up in the morning with a hangover. You wake up in the morning with emptiness. You wake up in the morning with great regret. You're sleeping with somebody. You don't even know their name. Get quiet up in here. 
but there's a reality. And then you say, man, the weed don't do it. Maybe I need a little Coke. Maybe a little speed, a little heroin. Maybe that's, man, I need something to take the edge off. And you could keep going down that road and keep going for the entertainment and keep going for the girls and keep going for the guys and keep just trying to figure out your sexuality. But none of that's going to make you whole. None of it's going to make you complete. You need someone to make you brand new. You need someone to forgive you and save you and give you eternal life. You can't save you. And I also say this, a religion can't save you. Be careful. That if someone asks you, are you saved, you start mentioning the religion you belong to. A religion can't save you. A religion only gives you rules. I'm not here to give you rules. I'm here to give you a savior that loves you, that died for you, that resurrected, that suffered for your sins so you could be forgiven. There's a price to pay for your sins and someone paid it. The perfect man paid it. Let's look at that for just a second. This is not no afterthought. Jesus knew his time. The time has come. And John 12, 23 says, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. God's just saying, he's talking about himself as that kernel. I'm going to die. But his death will produce many new kernels. A plentiful harvest of new lives. New lives. God is saying, I'm going to give my life. But the harvest of me giving my life, my life's going to be the seed. But the harvest of me giving my life is there's going to be a whole bunch of people that get brand new lives. They're going to get brand new beginnings. They're going to get eternal life. I thank God that Jesus gave his life and he was buried and he rose again to the dead. So every single one of us can have a brand new life. If you don't understand it, your spirit understands what I'm saying. Now, verse 27. My soul is deeply troubled. Now understand, going to the cross was, was troubling Jesus and his humanity. Because even though he was God, he, he, had, a, he had a body. And he, he knew the suffering that he would go through. The ridicule, the betrayal, the loneliness on that cross. The nails in his hands. The crown of thorns on his head. The shame, the mocking. The nails in his feet, bleeding, can't breathe. His, body, his, his joints are out, his, his joints are out, they're out, they're out of place. He can't breathe. He's dying there. And this is what the scripture says. What am I going to do? My soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray? Father, save me from this hour. But this is the very reason I came. I could say save me for this hour, but it's not going to save you. So I'm going to pay the price for every wrong thing you've ever done so you could be forgiven of every single sin. I'm not, going to sat, I'm not going to pray for me to be saved. I'm going to pray for you to get saved. And I'll pray the price so you can have eternal life. Give God some praise for the one and only Savior that didn't, come on, he didn't. He wasn't a coward. He faced it because he loved you. There's no greater love than one has for another than to lay down his life. Jesus didn't just say, I love you. He goes, let's go. I'm going to die and suffer for every one of your sins. That's a real man. In 1 Peter 3.18, it says, Christ himself suffered when he died for you. I, I just think we become so religious about this moment, we don't feel it anymore. And that's why some, a, a lot of people's worship is so weak. And that's why it's so easy for you to walk away from the Lord because you don't, you don't really know what was paid, how much God loves you and the price that was paid so you could be forgiven, so you could be set free, so you could have eternal life. But there's only one way. It's Jesus and he paid the price. There's no other man that ever lived that paid the price. Men have come and started religions, but none of them claim to be a savior because none of them were. You know, if you're a Muslim in here, I'm not dogging, dogging with your faith. This is all I'm saying is Muhammad never claimed to be a savior. Buddha never claimed to be a savior. They came with teachings, but they didn't come as saviors. 
The big problem you have, and every single person has, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners on death row, ready to be sentenced for eternity. And what's going to get you off death row? That means the sin has to be paid for. You're not going to get out of jail unless the, the bail is paid. You guys understand this? There's no way around it. The judgments have already been made. But we thank God that God sent his only son. God in the flesh. Never sinned. Perfect. 100% righteous. And this is what the Bible says about it. Look at this. This is good. In 1 Peter 3.18, Christ himself. Someone say Christ himself. Because if it was me, I would have sent somebody else. I would say, well, let's do some delegated authority. I'm God. Let's send one of those angels. But God said, no, I'm going to send myself. I love you. And I want you to get this. No one loves you more than God. There's nobody that loves you more than God. No one's given their life for you like this. He loves you. And when he was on that cross, this is what he said, forgive them for they know not what to do. Just think about this. You wouldn't do that. I don't think. I mean, someone can't even like cut you off on a free without you getting a little crazy. And you're a Christian. Doing still sign language. Stop in the name of Jesus. Right? Someone just gets on your nerves and you're like, oh, no, you don't even know. Uh, 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 what? Huh? I might be a Christian, but hey, you don't even know who you're messing with. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is let get, let's get rid of that and understand. Let's be more like Jesus. And Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because he was saying, we can't hold this against them. They're mocking me. They're spitting in my face. They're crucifying me. Every one of them betrayed me. Every one of them left me after I taught them. But of God, don't hold this against them. Because the reason I'm suffering is to save them. And if you hold this against them, they cannot be saved. Christ himself suffered when he died for you. I love this. I just, I just pray you get this. That salvation, I know it's free to you, but it wasn't free to him. And I think in an entitlement society that we live in today, we want just everything just because you're human. But understand this, this salvation had the highest price. And so why, why such a high price? Because you show how much you value by what you're willing to pay for it. And God is saying, I value you so much. I value you more than my son. It's crazy. Look at this. And with that one death, he paid for your sins. For that one death, he paid the wage of your death. For that one death, he paid the weight of your addiction. For that one death, he paid the price for your freedom. For that one death, he paid the price to deliver you from hell and judgment and the grave. That one death made you righteous. That one death, come on, that one death gives you eternal life. That one death, not faith in you, but faith in him. I am saved not because I'm good. I am saved because God is good. I am saved not because I've earned it. I am saved because Jesus earned it. I am forgiven because Jesus paid the price. And I am free because he became a prisoner. I resurrect from the dead and I have eternal life because Jesus died and conquered death. We serve a God that not only died, but on the third day, he resurrected from the dead. So you can resurrect a new life. Look at this. He was not guilty, but he died for people who were guilty. Who did he die for? The guilty people. Who's the guilty people? You know, the, the, I, I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on you, but we got to be real. Stop trying to act like you're better than you're, you are. Come on. Thank God, like, God don't expose everything we do. 
Well, this week, what we're going to do is just put on the screen what sister so-and-so did in her little private time while she's, she's praising right here, but she wasn't there. Right? Sister Samantha, hallelujah, praise God. He's so good all the time. And then she's telling her husband off like, blankety blank, 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 going to blank, blank, and your mama and your daddy too. Ah, 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 uh, 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 uh. Praise the Lord. He's so good. <laughs> But he died for the guilty. You know what that means? That whatever guilt you have, you could get delivered from all your guilt and your shame. What God has said, when I erase your record, I completely erase it. Even if the devil tries to bring it up, he's trespassing. I won't acknowledge it because when I forgive you, I erase all the sin just like it never happened. Give God some praise that God forgives, not like your brother forgives, not like your sister forgives. He completely forgives because he paid the full price. He paid... He died for people who are guilty. He did this to bring all of you to God. That's why he did it. Now, he couldn't bring you to God until the price was paid. Because if he brought you to God before the price was paid, you would meet your judgment. And you'd meet up with the wrath of God. Now, a lot of people don't like to talk about the wrath of God or the judgment of God. If you don't talk about the wrath and judgment of God, you don't know who God is. He's a loving God. And he'll do everything that he can to save you. But understand, when you continue to reject and reject and reject, you're storing up wrath and judgment upon yourself. And that's why a life apart from God has natural consequences. And you're thinking, God has punished me. God said, I'm not even punish punishing you. You're just experiencing the consequences of your bad decisions. You don't even understand what punishment is. If I get involved in your life, it's over. But right now is not a time of judgment. Right now is not a time, come on, of suffering. Right now is a time for you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and have your faith in him, believe in him. Let's end it with this. This is crazy. This is crazy. Because Peter's crazy. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Not on my watch, buddy. <laughs> now Jesus turned to Peter, just real quiet. He goes, get away from me, Satan. Peter like, oh, no, you did. You didn't just call me Satanas, did you? <laughs> right? And you said that pretty loud. Everybody heard you. Can we just keep that a little lower? I thought I was the rock. I mean, I thought, come on, I thought me and you a few verses ago had it together. Jesus, get away from me, saying you are a dangerous trap for me. You are seeing things from merely a human point of view, not from God's. Now, I want you to get this, is that if you hear this good news about Jesus Christ, there's a demon and there's Satan that's coming with doubt and unbelief and satanic philosophies so that you do not believe and receive salvation. He doesn't want you to believe the good news, the gospel, that Jesus suffered and he died and resurrected from the dead for your sins. He wants you to believe demonic philosophies from human points of view. And you start thinking, well, is Jesus who he says he is? Or not today. I know I need Jesus, but maybe tomorrow. I'm telling you, that's Satan. See, Satan doesn't come with a pitchfork and a long tail. Like, I don't get you. He comes with thoughts and ideas from human points of view just think about it. Do you think this earth just was created or how about evolution? Which you need more faith to believe in 
evolution, because you got to believe in this, that everything came from nothing. We're not saying everything came from nothing. We're saying everything came from our creator, the creator of the universe, and there's order. Come on, God has created a, a world of order. Thank God. Come on, every morning you wake up, that sun comes up. Every day there's oxygen because we serve a God that created everything so you could live, and he created a heaven. Believe it. Or you start thinking, well, I don't know if there's any, I mean, everything. If there's any absolute right or wrong, not sure. Where'd you get the philosophy from? No absolutes. Who taught you that in your, in, in your university? Before, before you went to university, you were wise. You came out of the university and you came out believing. You, you came out a fool. Someone taught you. See, being an atheist, you're not born an atheist. You're born a believer. That's why every single child in our children's ministry believes in God. You have to be taught to be an atheist. You have to be listening to satanic philosophies. And it's still happening today. And that's what Jesus is saying. All these philosophies are there to stop you from believing in Jesus Christ. How many understand that? Let's read this last scripture here. God is good. How many know God is good? Let's read this last scripture. In Luke 8, 12. And this is what happened to Peter. This is how that satanic thought came. He began to look at things from a human point of view. What was a human point of view? I want to like, I mean, Jesus, let's take over this earth and put me like one of your right hand men and let's be rich. And if anybody messes with us, we'll just kill them. Do you think Peter didn't think that way? When they came to arrest Jesus, he took out a sword and cut off the, 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 the soldier's ear. He was like a killer. That's after spending three years with Jesus. He was thinking from a human point of view. But look at this. The seeds, someone said the seeds are the word of God. That fell on the, this Luke 8, 12. That fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message. Have you heard the message? Now understand, hearing the message is not enough if you doubt the message. Peter heard the message. He doubted it. As a matter of fact, he not only doubted it, he fought against it. He resisted it. He rejected it. And not only did he reject the message of the Lord, he accepted the message of Satan. And how do we know what we receive? What we receive, we repeat. What we receive, What? So what do you say? Oh, they hear the message only they have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. Satan doesn't want you to believe because if you believe, you could be saved. You could be made whole. You could be forgiven of every one of your sins. You could receive God's spirit inside of you. You could finally get some peace. You could finally live a life, Father, of fulfillment. You could finally go to heaven. You could finally, come on, be a blessing to your family and be a blessing to your kids. Come on, you could finally move forward and accomplish your purpose. This is what God is saying. I don't, saying is saying, I don't want you to believe because if you believe, you'll be saved. You'll be made whole. You'll be free. You'll have eternal life. You're going to finally fulfill, find your purpose. Wow. I love it. All we got to do is believe. Now, this is the question. As Jesus is speaking to you and you're hearing this message, are you going to let the devil come in and put doubt and give you a, a thought like, not now, maybe later? Because today's the day of salvation. Tomorrow's not guaranteed to anybody. What are the chances of you coming here tonight and hearing a message, which is the, God, it's the, it's the, it's the Bible message? And Jesus is shifting everything in your life. He goes, let's talk about the nitty-gritty or sin issue. I love you. God's not here to judge you, put you down, condemn you. He's here to save you, make you whole, forgive you, and give you a brand new start. And no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done, all your sins have been paid for. Just receive the payment. Say it with me. Just receive the payment. Not only does it forgive you, but it gives you a new life. Are you ready for an invasion of God's spirit inside you? You know, man, like beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that I'm a new person. God is inside me now. 
I'm thinking differently. Like, I'm having strength to say no to things I, like I got no strength to say no to. I have a peace when I go to bed that I'm not alone, that God is with me. And I know if I were to die right now, that night I was saved. That week before Easter, I got saved. God changed my life. Let's all stand up. We'll dismiss in just a second. No one leave until we dismiss. Let's not be like Peter <laughs> and start talking ourselves out of the miracle. Peter finally got it. So let's not, I mean, thank God Peter finally got it. He got it afterwards, but he got it after, this is when he got it, after he saw Jesus resurrect from the dead. He got it. And he got filled with God's spirit, changed his life forever. And of course, his whole life was changing people's lives. And he got martyred for believing in Jesus and he died like a champion. We're going to see him one day in heaven. And we're going to and say, Peter, you, you know, you, you, know you've got, you, 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 you made us laugh a few times, you little crazy little guy. But I think some of us really associate with Peter. And even like, so you're like, man, that's kind of like me. Right? But thank God there's real stories in the Bible where people make really mistakes, real mistakes. But then there's a real Savior that loves them and forgives them and Say, come here. I still got a call in your life. Your sin and your mess up does not conquer my love for you. Today's your day of salvation. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. And there's no way to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior without making a decision. It's impossible. It's, like, it's not like you accident. like, are you married or not? Like, I don't know. Well, did you, did you, go, did you go through a ceremony? Well, I don't know. You, you're not married, bro. Right. It's the same thing with following Jesus. It's a real decision. You actually have a new birth date. I was born um, April 21st, 1967. It was a great year. But then I have another date. It's my birth date. Spiritual birth date. When I was born again. How many understand that? Now, you must be born again. If you're saying today, Pastor, and this is this reality, just question. If I were to die tonight, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. But I really do believe that Jesus died for my sins and suffered for all the wrong I've done. So, to pay the price for everything I've done. And I want to receive his forgiveness. And I want to live a brand new life today. I'm not, I don't, I'm, you're not joining a religion, but I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to, I want to receive the gift of eternal life today. I want to place my faith in him. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. And, and there's also people that you backslidden. And if you backslidden, you need to come back home. You need to come back home. We don't even know if you're saved. Get back home. They give your life to Jesus, 100%. Come on, it's the best thing you'll ever do. One, when I say three, I want you to raise your hand to all this building. I want to place my faith in Jesus. I want Jesus to save me now. I want forgiveness of sins. I want to receive eternal life. I want Jesus to set me free. I want his spirit to come in me and bring me a brand new person. Two, and when I say three, don't be ashamed. God's not ashamed of you. One, two, three, raise your hands all over this building. I want to give my life to Jesus. Come on, you're not listening to Satan. Come on, you're listening to God. I'm proud of every one of you. Come on, all our visitors that came for the first time right here, they're in the spitting section and they got saved. Awesome. Ask your neighbor, you want to go up? You want to give me, you want to go up there with me? I'll go up there with you. I want those that raise their hand to do one more step. I want you to leave your seat and come up here. We're just going to pray with you. You're not going to do no speeches or nothing, but this is, just, come on, this is like getting married. Come on, you're walking up the aisle and say, I'm in. I'm 100% in. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. Come on, leave your depression at the seat. Come on, leave your sickness at the seat. Come on, leave your, come on, leave your pain at the seat. Leave your sin at the seat. Come on, church, let's give the Lord a big hand. Come on, people are getting saved. Think of what Jesus did. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never Forgiveness is here. Come on, freedom is here. Peace is here. Eternal life is here. New beginnings are here. Rest is here. Breakthrough is here. Victory is here. Proud of you.
on, let's make some more room up here. Come on, let's make some more room. Come on, I need some DG leaders. I need some leaders up here. I'm going to probably need another 30, 40. You online, come on. If you gave your life to Jesus, don't tune out right now. Come on, you stand up right where you're at. The Holy Spirit is touching you. There's tears coming down in your eyes because God's Spirit is right there right now speaking to you. He loves you. God is good. Hallelujah. This is what we're saying to saying, Satan, get behind me now. You're not going to lead my life anymore. You're not going to torment me anymore. In the name of Jesus, I'm free. I'm free. I'm receiving my freedom. Come on, they're still coming, church. Come on. I want you to understand this. This is not always, this is not normal in a lot of churches. Come on, thank God that you're in a church that preaches the gospel and causes people. The Holy Spirit is causing people to be convicted of their sin and repent and give their lives to Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand. Holy Spirit's doing his job. Proud of you. Now, there's a scripture that says this. The road to hell, or the highway to hell, is wide, and many choose that path. But the road to heaven is narrow, it's difficult, and few find it. You found it tonight. I'm not saying that you're not going to be going against the grain of society but you're finally going to be on the right track, headed in the right direction. Yes, you're going to be fighting. It's called a fight of faith, but it's going to be worth it. Every day, you're going to get stronger. Every day, you're going to have more peace. But today, you're getting saved. And today, you're being forgiven. And today, you receive eternal life. And today, you become a child of God, period. You become a child of God, period. Period. That's it. Okay, today. He's going to be your father. He'll never leave you. Say, man, what if I mess up? Let's all say, confess your mess up and get back up. But God's not leaving you. It's it for God. You're making a decision to follow Jesus as his disciple. The word disciple means student. So we have classes here for you to learn and grow. Baptism class, all kinds of classes. But we love you and you're not part of our family. And that's it. This family ain't going nowhere. So you don't go nowhere. I'm asking you for a year of your life. Keep coming to church. It's going to get better and better and better. You're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And don't let the devil lie to you when you leave. Oh, nothing happened there. It's just emotional. No, something. You know something happened because before church started, if someone told you, you know you're going to walk up there, you go, I ain't walking up there. But God spoke to you so strong that he got you to leave those seats and you're taking your walk with God tonight. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray right now. Repeat after me. Say, say, Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much that you suffered for my sins and then you died to pay the price for the wrong I've done. So that I could be forgiven. And I believe you rose from the dead. Today, I make a decision to turn from my sin life. I'm tired of doing it my way. Forgive me, Lord. Set me free. And fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Today, I am saved. I receive the free gift of eternal life. I am now a child of God, and you're my father. I thank you, Jesus, for saving me tonight. And Satan, I command you now, get out of my life. Get out of my mind. Get out of my family. I belong to Jesus. And I'll follow him for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I am free. Hallelujah. God bless you guys. Love you.